You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Hello everyone, and welcome to History of the Great War, episode 165. This week, I would like to thank Colin, Charles, Richard, and Howard for choosing to support this podcast on Patreon, where they now get access to special Patreon-only episodes. For those who may have looked at the Patreon campaign before, but it's been a little while. In the last week or so, I've updated the whole page, uh, lots of different and new rewards, as well as a really detailed post about what you can expect about the podcast in the future. Now, that same information will be in next episode after we do some listener Q&A, but if you want a sneak preview, head on over to patreon.com slash historyofthegreatwar to find out more. This episode, I would also like to call out the podcast's website. It's been a long time since I talked about it, but it has episode notes for every episode, including sources, maps, and a full transcript. I know that a lot of people are new and probably haven't even heard that it exists, but it's over at historyofthegreatwar.com. Also, before we get started, next episode will be entirely listener question-based. Well, if you are listening to this, you are too late to get your question into episode 166. Feel free to send it in and I will answer it in the future. You can send questions via the podcast Twitter account at twitter.com slash history of the great war on Facebook at facebook.com slash history of the great war or through good old fashioned email at history of the great war at outlook.com. This episode represents our last on the German Spring Offensives. We're going to spend the first half of the episode focusing on some of the first actions of the American Expeditionary Force. When we will, then we will move on to a discussion of the last two German offensives, which would be codenamed Operation Neisenau and Operation Friedenstorm. Then we will spend just a bit discussing the offenses in, in court of total. In episode 167, we will shift focus over to the Allied attacks that begin in late summer 1918, and that will take us all the way to the armistice. Uh, The two stories pretty much blend together, with episode 167 basically going to pick up the story exactly where this one ends. Before any of that, though, I think we should talk about the Paris gun, because the Paris gun is really interesting, and I think we should talk about it. One of the most famous elements of the German spring offensives was an artillery gun that would come to be called the Paris gun. This piece of artillery was 210 millimeters in caliber, and its barrel was 118 feet long. This massive size and the 430 pounds of gunpowder used to fire it meant that its 264 pound projectile could be fired at a range of at least 80 miles. When it was fired, the shell would leave the barrel at 5,500 feet per second, Now, I know that 5,500 feet per second is really hard to visualize or even comprehend. For some pieces of reference, though, that's about 10 times faster than the French 75, and 7 times faster than the bullet from a Lee Enfield rifle that the British infantry were using. Also, that's 3,750 miles per hour. So basically, really, really fast. Really, really fast. The the stresses that this firing put on the barrel meant that it had to be made out of a special alloy developed by the Krupp factory, because a normal barrel would have probably just exploded. The length of the barrel meant that it had to be braced by a special cable system, and it could only be fired 50 times before it had to go through a maintenance process just to make sure it was still functioning. 
During this flight, during its flight, the show would reach a maximum height of 25 miles. This was so high, and the arc would be so long, that when trying to calculate where the shell would land, the Germans had to take not only the Earth, Earth's curvature into account, but also its rotation speed. That's quite the gun. And it was, of course, firing on Paris from some woods about 80 miles away. The first shell from the gun would arrive in Paris at about 7.20 a.m. on March the 23rd, and it would hit the Place de la République, it should be noted that the Germans were not really targeting specific areas where they were shooting. They just sort of were going for the center of Paris or, or thereabouts. The second show would hit about 20 minutes later, and this time it would hit uh, near the Gare de l'Est. At first, the French did not really know what was happening. It took hours before they realized that it was probably an artillery piece that was doing the damage, and that was determined only after they examined the shell fragments. In total, the Paris gun would fire 367 times, and in total it would kill 260 people. Eventually, after the Germans were forced to retreat in August, it was impossible to continue firing, since even the massive Paris gun was eventually pushed out of range. And in terms of actual results, it was kind of disappointing. From the very beginning, it was a terror weapon, not all that dissimilar from the V-1 and V-2 rockets that would be fired on London during the Second World War. And while it did cause some terror and panic in Paris, it never really had a big impact on the war. But that doesn't mean it wasn't a cool story. At the height of the panic around the German attacks of the spring, Pershing had agreed to let American units serve within the French army, and since that time, Patan had been eager to take advantage of the American units. The first division to arrive was the American 1st Division, the Big Red One. Before moving north, the first had been positioned near saint Mihail, south of Verdun, but it had been moved west and north to help the French. They were positioned very close to the tip of the salient produced by Operation Michael, and they were placed in this position because it was believed that the Germans would attack there soon. Interestingly enough, it would not be this division that would be the first to engage in serious combat with the Germans, but instead the one that took their place to the south. This would be the American 26th Division, and it was because of the fact that it took over for the 1st Division that it would be the first American division to see large-scale combat against the Germans. The action would be, in essence, just a very large raid, and it would be launched by the Germans early in the morning on April 20th. In this attack, several thousand German troops would follow behind a creeping barrage, and since they were shielded by fog, they were able to capture the village of Sichpri. During the attack, two companies of Americans essentially ceased to exist, but later in the day other American units would arrive and they would be able to launch a counterattack that retook the village. Overall, this was seen as a huge American victory, even though they had lost more men in some territory, because they had at least mostly contained the German attack, or the German raid. Really, it was pretty small uh, on the grand scheme of things. While the 1st Division had been moved into the French lines, there was also some discussion about where other American troops could be placed along the front. Both the French and British wanted more American troops, for obvious reasons. During a meeting on May 1st, the disagreements about how best to distribute American troops became the topic of conversation in a pretty heated conversation developed between Haig and Patan. Foch would try to reduce the argument by saying that there would be plenty of Americans to go around, and he also declared that after June 1st, both the British and French would receive equal numbers of them. Pershing, who was also present at the meeting, had to speak up at this point. He had originally agreed to give American units to the other armies at a time of great crisis, when it appeared that the situation was very serious. But now it was clear that the other leaders were planning to continue to take more men as long as they could, and this was just not what Pershing had signed up for. The other generals also wanted Pershing to continue to send over mostly just infantry troops, not too many support troops or too much equipment, just men that could hold rifles in the trenches. All the generals knew that if the Americans focused mostly on the infantry, they would not be able to create large American units or armies due to the lack of support in logistics troops, and the infantry would therefore be dependent on the British and French. Pershing made it clear that this was not what he wanted to happen, and as the front stabilized and then shifted back in the favor of the Allies, he would become more adamant with his demands. While there were all kinds of discussions happening about the future, Pershing and his generals wanted to get into the fight now, and not just on the defensive, but instead to launch their own attacks. For this first offensive, Pershing would get together with General Bullard, who was the commander of the 1st Division, 
Now they wanted to launch an attack, but they were technically under the command of the French, and specifically General Demenay, but he would put his full support behind the effort. For the target of this attack, the Americans would choose the village of Chateauneuf, which was near the position of the 1st Divisions. This was right at the tip of the small salient into the American lines that had been created by a small German attack, but that made it the perfect target. The regiment that would lead the attack was brought out of the line to receive special training. A terrain was found for them to practice the assault on, they practiced following a creeping barrage. They instructed the men on how to work with tanks that would be provided by the French. Basically everything that was needed for the attack they prepared for. The Americans would essentially be as prepared as they could be for the attack. The French were even throwing in some artillery support, with General Debenet promising 250 guns, including some heavy pieces that were larger than anything the Americans had. Now, I want to make clear that this was not a major attack. It was being executed by one division, and the village itself was not very important. But for Pershing, Bullard, and the other American leaders, it was an important step since the first large attack that they would launch would be this one, and hopefully there would be more in the future. If it was successful, it would go a long way to proving that the Americans were ready for more than just holding the line and taking up space. Pershing also hoped that it would prove the American troops should be concentrated together into their own army so that they could launch their own far larger attacks. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. The attack was scheduled to begin on May the 28th. If you remember back to last episode, this is just one day after the Germans launched Operation Blucher York against the French between Rheims and Soissons. It was because of this that the American attack would be robbed of much of its assistance that had been promised by the French, because it was all on its way to meet the Germans to the south. Most importantly, this meant that the heavy artillery and the aircraft that Debenet had pledged to the attack were gone but this did not deter the Americans, and even with the reduction in firepower, they still moved forward. The early hours of the attack would go quite well, and during the early morning, the Americans were able to capture the village of Chantenay uh, by about 7 a.m. The advance would then continue up the ridge on the other side, and again it would be captured quickly and pretty efficiently. Things were going great. The attack had only cost about 50 American casualties, and they'd taken over 100 German prisoners. However, as always during the war, the first push was really just the beginning, and once the American advance ended, the Germans would spend the next four hours preparing their counterattack. During these hours, the Americans frantically prepared defenses, which were important protection from German artillery shells. Throughout the day, the bombardment would continue before the German infantry would finally attack in the early morning. Over the course of several hours, the Germans would launch multiple attacks, but most of them were poorly coordinated with their supporting artillery. This made the defense far easier for the Americans, and while they were pushed hard, they would eventually beat back the German attacks. 
In these defensive efforts, the American casualties would balloon to over a thousand. When it was all over, the Americans held some of the territory that they had taken. So it had been a small attack with small numbers of men involved, but it had been an important victory for the Americans. One action that I mentioned last week probably deserves a bit more detail, and that is the American defense of the French village of Chateau Thierry. During the last few days of May and the 1st of June, the Germans began to move towards Chateau Thierry. In A World Remade, G.J. Meyer would explain why. Quote, the essential next step was to get men, guns, and supplies across the Marne, in position for a direct move on Paris. To do that, the Germans needed bridges, which is what made the town of Chateau Thierry, almost directly in the path of the German advance, suddenly loom large. There were two bridges at Chateau Thierry, substantial bridges carrying rail and motor traffic, and only one French colonial division was available to keep them out of German hands. End quote. The first American troops to arrive would be a machine gun battalion, which would arrive first because they had their own transportation. They would arrive on the scene on May 31st, just in time to take part in the defense of the city from the German attack. Over the coming days, more American troops would arrive, and that would prevent the Germans from taking the bridges over the river. This was a critical area of defense, and the American forces had been able to meaningfully contribute to the defense. This action was overshadowed by everything else that was happening due to the German Blucher York operation that we discussed last week, but it was another important contribution from the AEF. And while the defense of Shadow Theory was not the primary reason that Blucher York failed, it was at least some small part of the equation. But even though the operation had failed, the Germans were still not done and instead decided to try once again, this time in an operation called Neisenau. After Blucher York ended, the Germans had to make a decision about what to do next. With so many casualties they had sustained, it was getting to the point where it was difficult to mass a sufficient number of men to launch large attacks, but they had to do something, since the Allies were still not defeated and were not yet at the negotiating table. There were still multiple areas where they could launch an attack. They could try again in Flanders, they could try to increase the size of the Michael salient, they could try to push closer to Paris through the salient created by Blucher York. Each of these areas had its trade-offs. In Flanders, well, just in the north in general, the British and French were quite strong. In the south, the attack might be easier, but it would be required to advance further to meet meaningful objectives. There was one area where this was not the case, though, and that was the area between the two salients, between Michael and Blucher York. With the German advance having happened on both sides, sort of by default, the French salient that was formed jutted out into the German lines. If this attack was successful, the two salients could be joined together, which would greatly increase the ability of the German army to move troops laterally along the front. The day for this effort was put on June 9th, which meant that they did not have long to prepare, since there would be just a few days between the end of Blucher York and the beginning of Neisenau. Unlike during previous attacks, where the French had been caught off guard by the German attacks, they would have good intelligence for Neisenau due to German prisoners, aerial observation, and most importantly, German wireless signals. On June 2nd, a French captain had broken the German wireless code, and this had allowed the French to listen in on almost all German wireless traffic. What they heard was that the attack was scheduled to begin on June 7th. It would later be delayed, which they would learn from German prisoners who deserted before the attack began. Interestingly, during these last German attacks, there was often an increase in the number of Germans voluntarily giving themselves up in the days before an attack was scheduled to begin, which was not a good sign for the German army, but was great for the French because they got a lot of uh, intelligence out of it. All of this information allowed the French to launch a counter-barrage right before the German artillery attack would begin. And at that point, the greatest German vulnerability was how many troops they had packed into the front lines, making them easy targets for the French artillery. Even with really good information about where and when the attack would occur, the Germans were still able to make some initial successes. The attacks would be launched along a front 33 kilometers wide, with 11 divisions in the front line and 7 following behind. They would meet far less resistance than expected on the first day and would advance almost 9 kilometers while taking several thousand French prisoners. While this was similar to previous attacks, it's pretty much where the similarities ended. This time, the French had been able to retreat in a far more orderly fashion, which meant that they were able to recover far more quickly. They were also able, critically, to destroy the bridges over the River Wa. This meant that when the Germans reached the river on the second day of their attack, they had a hard time pushing forward. 
This meant that on the second day, after an advance of just five kilometers, the Germans were stopped. And unlike on previous efforts, there would not be a third day of German advances. Instead, the French were preparing a large counterattack that they prepared overnight between June 10th and 11th, before launching it at 11 a.m. on June the 11th. And after just a half-hour bombardment, four French divisions attacked forward. They would not advance far, just three kilometers, give or take, but they would take a thousand prisoners. This would not come close to recapturing all the ground that they had lost at the start of the German attacks, but it did seriously disrupt any German plans to continue the attack, and when they did try again on the 12th, they were stopped cold. After this failure, the offensive was cancelled, and once again the Germans found themselves with more territory captured, but little else to show for their efforts. They had been able to inflict 40,000 casualties on the French, while only suffering 25,000 of their own, but by this point, these types of numbers didn't really matter that much. The most important outcome was that for the first time during the spring offensives, the French had been able to launch a quick counterattack, and not while the Germans, you know, had already ground to a halt, but instead while they were still attacking, and that counterattack had been successful. The German leaders were not clueless. They could see that their army was fading, but there was still more effort left in them, and they would be given a month to prepare for their last attack. The 5th German attack would have the official codename of Marnschutz Rem, which I will probably never say again because that's much better known as Friedenstorm, or Peace Storm. This would be the largest German attack since the opening day of Michael, and it was a giant pincer move around Rem. There would be 52 divisions committed to the attack, basically every spare man that the German army had at this point in the war, and they would be joined by 900 aircraft and over 6,000 guns on a front of 119 kilometers. While the number of guns was quite large, due to the width of the attack, the density was not as high as on previous efforts. The Germans would also meet a far larger number of allied guns due to how wide the frontage of the attack was. The attack would be focused both to the west and east of Rem, on the Marne and in Champagne. The goal was to free up the Rem railway so for the usage of the Germans. In the previous weeks, they had been able to free up one railway into the salient created by Blucher York, but it was only a single tracked line, and it did not provide the required capacity for the German forces who relied on it for supplies. It was for this reason that Ludendorff's hand was sort of forced. He could either abandon the salient, which was a political and morale-based impossibility, or the Germans could try to take Rem. While this attack was massive, it was once again also just a setup for another attack, once again to be launched in Flanders. This time, the second attack would be called Hagen. This was to have been the sixth German attack of the year, and it was believed, again, to be the decisive one. It would be smaller than Friedenstorm, but it was thought to be sufficient since Friedenstorm would pull the British and French forces south. Once the attack in the south was um, launched, the Germans would rush troops to the north, and on August 4th, Hagen would be launched. It would require all the efforts of the German railways and a lot of work to pull it off, but it could hopefully be done. They would never know if they could have pulled it off, because Hagen would never happen, for reasons we are about to discuss. On the Allied side... While they had done very well at stopping the last German attacks, they were still not prepared to launch their own offensive efforts, and so they braced for another German attack. They were not positive where the Germans would attack, but there was a lot of evidence that would fall around Rem. One of the reasons that there was this evidence was because of the shorter darkness hours in July. At the latitude that France is at, the shortest nights of the year are in late June and in July, and this hindered the ability of the Germans to keep their preparations secret, since they were so dependent on doing all the troop movements at night. Even with the body of evidence that Patan had, he still had problems convincing Foch that the Germans would attack in the south, because there were also clear signs of German preparations in Flanders. These preparations were early work on the Hagen Offensive that was supposed to come later. But in this case, it worked as a pretty good distraction. It would not be until July 10th, with just five days before the attack, that Patan convinced the other leaders that the attack would fall against the French in the south. While Patan did not have all the troops he wanted, I mean, I don't think Patan ever had all the troops he wanted, but that's a different story, 
he did at least have a few generals around Rem who actually listened to him. And this meant that to the east of Rem, the 4th Army had been arrayed with a defense in depth scheme, which would provide far better protection against the coming German attack. This was not true along the entire front that the Germans would attack, but enough of the front would be properly prepared to present the Germans with some problems. During the week before the attack, more French divisions were brought in, with the number of defenders going from 17 divisions in line and 9 in reserve to 20 divisions in line and 15 in reserve in just a week, and those 9 extra divisions would be important. By the eve of the attack, the French had enough information to launch a counter-bombardment before the German attack, and it would begin about 45 minutes before the Germans were scheduled to begin. When the German bombardment did begin, it was very similar in composition to previous attacks, with gas shells, smokes, high explosives, all being used during a three-hour bombardment. At 4.50 a.m., a total of 27 divisions would go forward, and what they found to the east of Rem surprised them. They found almost no resistance, and so they stayed behind their creeping barrage and continued to move forward. Over the first five or six hours, very little resistance was encountered, but at the end of that time, something became obvious. The French had abandoned some of the front right before the Germans attacked, and they retreated to a strong second line of positions. Once the Germans ran into these positions, they found it impossible to continue, because it was outside the range of most of their artillery. It would take days before the artillery could be brought forward, and then the attack restarted. Even in the areas where the French defenses had been more concentrated towards the front, the Germans still found that they were slowed down far more quickly than in the past, and by the end of the first day it was clear that something was different this time. The German commanders ordered the attack continued the next day, but even less was gained. While the Germans were having problems, the Allies were continuing to bring in a stream of reinforcements, and this included five American divisions, which were more like ten European divisions because the American divisions were twice the size of those of the other armies at this point in the war. By the night of July 18th, the German advances would be over, with the balance sheet having another 50,000 German casualties added to it, balanced against 59,000 Allied casualties. In his book, Uh, With Our Backs to the Wall, Victory and Defeat in 1918, David Stevenson would say, quote, Having once more failed to broaden out the southern salient, Ludendorff was thrashing in a trap of his own making. While his army's casualties since the spring numbered nearly a million, even if OHL refused to recognize the game was up, that truth was more and more evident to its men. In the Second Battle of the Marne that now opened, the the reserve of fresh divisions that in June still so perturbed the Allies began rapidly to run down, leaving the Germans with the only option of submitting to their enemy's assaults until they could endure no more. It would be at this point that the Allied counterattacks, starting with the Second Battle of the Marne, would begin, and that also means that this is where this episode and this series of episodes comes to an end. This has been our ninth episode on the German Spring and Summer Offensives of 1918. They had started off the year in a pretty good position, with more troops on the Western Front in early March, and three years of victories on other fronts behind them. Then, over the next four months, they had thrown themselves, time and time again, against the Allied defenses. Over their five major offensives, the German army's strength had fallen from five million to just four million men, and those numbers were never going to bounce back. The objective of these attacks had been to win the war, or at least bring the Allies to the negotiating table, and they had failed. The German army had not been up to the task. Instead, the Allies were even more united than ever, and they were ready to take their turn on the offensive. That is where our next series of episodes will begin, with the Allied counterattacks during the Second Battle of the Marne, where four years after the miracle of the Marne, the Allies would once again stop the Germans and cause them to retreat. Only this time, the attacks would not end until the war was over.